Hi, Sasha. We have Sarah Stockton on today. So could you tell us a little bit more about Sarah? Sure. So um, Sarah Stockton is a licensed marriage and family therapist, lecturer, researcher, presenter, and clinical supervisor of a psychotherapy practice in central New York. In 2012, she co-authored and published one of the first mental health assessments utilized to assess youth readiness for medical treatment and gender transition. So Sarah spent the first part of her career as a clinician actually treating and advocating on behalf of youth and families who were exploring transition as an option. And she was among a very small handful of people with extensive training around trans issues. And she went on to train others as well, like medical facilities, physicians, schools, on how to provide what was then called gender affirming care. Um, she's treated well over 100 families, and she also wrote many of the first letters that were used to approve gender transition surgeries on minors. And as she tells us today, she came to discover that even her in-depth training was actually full of holes. And not only that, but the population she was seeing started to change as she saw more teenage girls coming in with gender issues. And she became really uncomfortable with the kind of patient-led approach and the new gender ideology that she saw come into her work. Yeah, I, I think Sarah's interview, I think it's very interesting, our, our interview with her. I think it is going to be part of a new cohort. No more than there's parents who roll back, there's affirmative clinicians who roll back and they're going to be a group and how they yeah. do it is very interesting. I know our style of, of kind of our podcast is very therapeutic, Sasha, and we, we offer a kind of a, a therapist exploration into any given, you know, so we don't, we're not like, you know, people in, in the UK and Ireland, we know Jeremy Paxman, who's this heavy hitting investigative reporter. We're not pinning anybody to the wall and we're not even interested. We want to know how did it unfold and what was it like in this person's world so that people can kind of literally step into that person's world to figure out what is it like? Imagine Sarah, she truly believed in her work. She thought she was uh, entering a very fast moving growth industry that would really help a huge amount of children who needed to transition and she was going to be the expert on the ground and she was going to help this and she was going to train lots of people and then over time she kind of lost her faith in the entire um in the entire field and that must have yeah. been shattering yeah i mean she kind of traces the early days where she was doing these two-year assessments she thought were very comprehensive and thorough. She describes how medical intervention was really only part of the process. It wasn't the only kind of outcome of treatment. And she describes like these kind of pivot points where she encounters her first detransitioner or a parent brings in some medical information about yeah. puberty blockers and the outcomes that she didn't know about despite her specialized training. And these kind of moments that began to chip away at her confidence in the field. And there were so many points where I think you and I did ask Sarah some difficult questions because we really wanted to understand how she synthesized all this information. But there were a lot of points in the discussion where in hindsight, you and I were kind of messaging each other like, oh, my God, how did we not ask more yeah. about that or this? There were some yeah. really kind of shocking stories that Sarah told. So we, we imagine listeners will also kind of highlight those moments. Um, yeah. But, you know, at some point, Sarah felt so uncertain about what was going on that she just kind of walked away from the field and processed some of this. And she describes this you know, multiple things happening, but particularly when her children were bringing home material from their schools and questions and confusion about kids transitioning that she realized, I can't really just run away from this. I kind of have to speak up. And so she eventually um, connected with Matt Walsh, who created the documentary, What is a Woman? And she appeared in that film. And she also appeared on Jordan Peterson's channel to talk about this. So she kind of walked away from the field and has now come back to basically tell her story and raise some of the concerns that she's become um, more aware of in the last few years. So yeah, there are going a, to be many clinicians like this, right? Who kind of go into this thinking they're helping and then realize something's wrong and come back to tell the story. Uh, and I, I hope there are many clinicians like Sarah. I think she, we have a lot to thank her for. She, she got into something and she got fully into it with, with, with full heart, thinking she was helping. 
And then as time went on, there's a shocking story in the interview about, you know, a man who, who had a court case and it didn't go his way and he ultimately he dies by suicide. So it's 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 a, a, a sad story and we didn't investigate it in in the podcast. But I think there's going to be many stories like that uh, as time goes on. We're going to hear, we've all heard the harrowing stories around transition. There are many of them. But I think we have a lot to thank people like Sarah Stockton who go into something full heart, truly believe what they're doing, see things and go, hang on, have the moral courage, which it takes a lot and we're exploring that specific issue, the, the ability to say, I made a mistake, I've got it wrong and I'm now going to stop. So she stopped and arguably did the right thing, which is to process what happened, think about what happened. She didn't come straight out of the traps immediately and start, um, you mm. know, like speaking to people like us. She She took a step back, stayed away from gender affirmative care, moved out of the field and then some years later felt compelled to speak up and I, I'd love if many people who are listening because I know 35 clinicians left the Tavistock in 2019 only a few of them are speaking up yeah so there's plenty who just walked away and probably moved into another field and said I don't know what happened there I'm moving on and we need them to speak up we need them all to speak up and it takes a lot of guts to do that yeah agreed so I think that's that's a good place to leave it and we'll let Sarah speak for herself. So, so here's our conversation with Sarah Stockton. Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories and psychological exploration, we probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture. And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Sarah, we are so glad to have you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's it's very exciting to, to, to talk to clinicians who've been affirmative and who have followed a path and ended up talking to us because it feels like there's real value in that. You know, there's yes, really, yeah. yeah. Where, where, I think as far as I know, where did it all begin with you? You, you were, I think a graduate student working, is that right? Yes, yeah, so in graduate school, so we're talking 2008, 2010, I graduated in 2010. Our, our college was really well known for uh, helping tra- well, I, we called transsexual at the time. So excuse mm-hmm. me, the terminology. What year or- approximately was that? Yeah, two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. Oh, sorry. Yes, oh, yes, yes. Okay. Two thousand eight to two thousand ten, um, where we were really primarily focused on working with adults who were struggling with gender dysphoria. And I think it was a couple of years prior to when I started in that school, we that school developed the hormone assessment that you would use to assess people's readiness for gender transition, like surgery, hormones, etc. And when I came on board, we decided that we really needed to develop something comprehensive to assess the youth. Because our thinking was, and what I was taught was, you know, if we could perhaps introduce puberty blockers early, we would, you know, alleviate some of the symptoms that people would experience during puberty. So we spent a good amount of time developing this assessment, which um, I'm come from a systemic program. So this assessment had to include hours and hours of assessment, assessment of the parents. So you could have at least three to four stories of the narrative of what's going on with the children. And that's where I really um, started working. And I probably was one of the first to sign off on, you know, double mastectomies or any hormone blockers then going on to hormones and bottom surgeries that how we know it now and that was yeah in 2010 where I really had my primary caseload was all youth and what age were they because that seems in this world that seems like aeons ago 2000 yeah yeah I mean I would say the average age that I was getting was like 14 mastectomies and 
Oh uh, yeah, yeah, you can't get the, you can't have one until sixteen, but yeah. starting the hormone blockers and then ultimately that's kind of the path that they yeah. were going on. I will say what was unique when I was doing the hormone assessment for adults. Primarily, I would say like eighty percent of my clients were male to female, but with youth, it was eighty percent female to male. So that was a a very different, distinct. Um, difference with the youth that I was seeing with my training that was a little different because I do think it presents and the symptoms look very differently depending on the gender of the person that we're talking about. And did you believe in the kind of the concept just fundamentally that there's an identity within you and they're trans and that needs to be medicalized as soon or had you a kind of a, a working theory on this? Yeah, I guess I think that's what's really weird about this is one, the terminology was kind of used as like transsexual. And so there was never, whereas now, like when you come in and that like someone could be the other gender. So there was no, I was not taught, nor did I teach to my clients that, you know, one day you would be a male, it would be you were presenting as a male. So I don't, this was, it was a way that we were treating gender dysphoria or body dysphoria. It wasn't just, I just feel it. So no, I mean, there was, I mean, I do think what's unique now is that, you know, with one session, you get a hormone letter. There's no analysis of what's going on in pathology. And, And there were times where we would pause someone from doing anything for a year or two years until they were able to fully understand what they were signing up for. And, um, and okay. I, that's about, and it's, go ahead. I was just going to say, let's keep going through the timeline. And then I think yeah. these, are, these are really interesting questions about like, what was the philosophy behind mm-hmm. at various points of the way, mm-hmm. you, you know, you guys were treating people. So, so you are working with what was then kind of considered transsexuals. And around transsexuals. 2010, you noticed that there was many more males transitioning who were adults, but mm-hmm. the females who you were seeing were youth. Correct. And 2010 is actually right before the huge spike mm-hmm. in the population. So I'm really interested to hear you. Know, you're plugging along with a relatively small population of kids yeah. and yeah. some adult men. And then what happens? Well, and I also want to say say the caveat of in order to treat transsexual clients, I had to be on, I had to go through a vigorous training about what this was. I had not only supervision for my regular cases, but we had special trans supervision. So we would come in, you know, present a case and, and go over it. So right now that doesn't happen. So at 2010, 2000 to 2014, I would say like, there isn't many of us trained. So there is only a few of us trained. And then I don't know how it happens, but eventually I become irrelevant, meaning that any therapist can do it. There's no uh, special training. Planned Parenthood got involved and started um, prescribing hormones without any medical or mental health assessment. So that shifted a lot for, for me. And from what I remember, and we will go back to your timeline because I am very interested in that. From what I remember, you were effectively young, ambitious, and you thought the science was settled. And this was a a really interesting world to get into where you would help an awful lot of people. And you could you could really make a mark in it because it was it had an awful lot of potential for growth. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, one of the things of like someone struggling with something that people can't see and I have a I have a medical condition that you can't see from the outside per se and I really had a lot of empathy and compassion for that um I guess I always had a, a sense that this is just one of the ways of treating it like I never when someone came in with body or gender dysphoria just thought to, that hormones was going to be alleviating that like I thought the work that we do would be alleviating that and that would be something else that would be happening. But now like they come in and say, I know hormones will will help me. You know, I know it will do this. And wow. that was a very different thing. You got to understand too, like 2007 smartphones come out. So I still have some time before people know the steps. So when I'm doing this, they don't know what they need to know in order to get hormones within five years, the hormone letter is online. So they come in and just know what to say to me, know, oh, I've been experiencing this since I've been five, you know, and that 
that really started making things um, dicey in terms of being able to say, oh, yeah, I'm a f- really looking at this in depth and it's not tainted by what they're seeing on social media and the groups that they're going to. So you're describing, <clears throat> excuse me, I think what you're describing is that there was some sort of tangible difference in your experience of patients, let's say pre 2010 ish and patients 2015 forward. Are you saying that's a different population? Oh, absolutely. Because they, so, I mean, we did have very few, but we did have uh, children as young as two that were coming in. I mean, I think what really changed, like affected me in the beginning was seeing children who didn't have language for gender talk about things. So when I saw a two-year-old being like, where's my penis? And they don't have a penis. Like, wow, like that is something that is dysphoria. That is not, you know, like, whereas someone coming in and saying I'm trans, like, oh, okay. You know that like, there's this, there's a different thing where it became, I'm still unclear if it's a chosen identity or something that's going on with you that we're treating. And the, the, the distinction is not there. Okay. Okay. So, so you are um, working and you start to see these things changed. Tell us mm-hmm. a little bit about what you started to observe. Yeah. And when I say working, I mean, not only did I see trans clients, I mean, I, I traveled the world with them to go to, like, I've trained with Marcy Bowers, I've trained with the, the surgeons, you know, I went to Philadelphia. I mean, I am teaching uh, medical practices how to be gender affirming care. The very surgeons that work on the children, I helped teach before they even started doing this. They didn't even know what they were doing until, you know, almost giving them fields. Like, I feel like I participated in endocrinologists who had no idea what they were doing now exclusively have thousands of youth patients, which is unbelievable. That. Just one thing. You said gender affirming care. Did you call it gender affirming care? And, yeah. What did you call it? I'm a bit obsessed with that phrase and trying to find who and when did it all begin? Yes. Um, yeah, we didn't, we didn't do the affirming. No, um, it was just care for transgender individuals. Yeah. I was looking at my uh, continuing education, like uh, packets that I would give out. Nothing. It was not gender affirming. No, oh. Oh. no. It's I'm so not new. sure where that came. Yes. Uh, that's got to be within like the last five or six years. I mean, affirming well, it, it gender was there came before. Ar- yeah, you, you yes. keep going. Yeah. yeah, affirming gender, I would say, did come around like 2012, right, where we started saying affirming um, gender, but, and, you know, assigned at birth. Um, but like dead name, that's definitely within the last three years. That's not something that was 10, 15 years ago. No, there's a lot of new jargon that is really coming from the advocacy groups, the activism, the academic side of this, the philosophical kind of like theory, queer theory side, which I don't think was probably as prominent when you were training, though they're they're so deeply integrated now that I think people have a hard time understanding like where is this concept coming from? Where is this idea coming from? But there are lots of different philosophies around gender that I, I think that's part of what we're trying to lift up. Like there are actually different belief systems people don't even know they have. Mm-hmm. And I think you're you're laying out a picture of like the old belief, which is that there are these types of people called transsexuals who have a condition mm-hmm. and the treatments are multifaceted and can yep. include medical interventions. Mm-hmm. And you're saying there's a new population that self-identifies Correct. as trans and come in demanding a predetermined idea of what treatment looks like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. Okay. And that's uh, what I'm, really started getting me concerned is that shift in presentation. And I'm curious if you, if the shift made you question anything about the old model also, or do you feel like those were two distinct things and the old model was, sorry, working well and the new model is not like, I'm curious about that. So I think it's both. And I think what happened was too, is like, I was, because I was kind of in trans 
working with transsexual, I was also, my focus was sex. So I had the opportunity to be introduced to a lot of cross dressers that are males who have no interest in transitioning. And me being able to have those types of cases was really important for me to see the difference between the erotic side of it. You know, I talk about, we weren't taught autogonophilia in school. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a terminology and they, they still aren't taught it. And I can understand pieces of why perhaps we aren't teaching it. I can understand that. And the same token, not having that perspective changed so much of just how I was able to help cross dressers. Right. I have intersex friend, intersex people that, that were truly intersex. They have complicated issues. So I was always able to see this as, OK, well, what if I had a client that came in? with body or gender dysphoria, but doesn't want to transition. Like, and I had those cases and it was, get, it's getting harder and harder for those people because they're just inundated with trans, you're trans, you're trans. Mm. And because I don't have cross dresser females, that was also a unique thing where I was like, you know, this has been going on since the beginning of time, some level, something real is happening to people. I'm not doubting that, but how we're treating that is concerning. And did you, when did you, like, on the whole concept of puberty blockers and you were blocking their sexual awakening, did that give you pause for thought or when did it give you pause for thought? Um, so in, in my, in our public, you know, we published this uh, assessment in a journal. So any medical professional uses this for like their basis. We say in our uh, research that there is no, uh, side effects to puberty blockers, which is false. And they're still teaching that to the graduate students. And so in my head, I was taught that this was something we're probably doing really positive to them, you know, like, and I didn't really have a concept till a little bit later that I was a part of the first, right? Like I'm a part of the first kids to get, I signed off on the first kids, double mastectomy mm -hmm. is the first kids to be on puberty blockers. It's not as if there was ever anything about this prior to when I started. And um, it did take one time, and, and this was wild because I'm probably six years in at this point where a parent came in with a handout to me and gave it to me and said, did you know what you're, you're suggesting for my child is not FDA approved? And I had not known that, I did not. So I felt kind of stupid, like I should know I'm in this field. Um, and I was like, no, I did not realize it was not FDA approved. And that, you know, I tried to pause the, the transitioning of that client, kind of slow it down to make uh, both parents comfortable and the courts overruled me. And that was where it was just very evident that I really don't matter. So why am I even doing this like at all? And I kind of just stopped. At that point, what happened when, when you discovered that six years into this work and all this training? I mean, it's it's interesting because you also <laughs> emphasize a few minutes ago you were going to these highly specialized trainings. Yes. Which we might presume means you have the most in-depth information sure. and you're the most aware of side effects. But there must have been something fundamentally wrong with this training, even before the ROGD population, mm -hmm. because you, as one of the world experts teaching endocrinologists, you didn't know this. So Correct. like what happened in your mind when this parent brought in a pamphlet and you were like, oh, like what happened next? How, how did your brain process that? Because that must have been shocking. Yeah, No, it was. And I mean, again, I... <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing to say, but I had pride myself on, I could get any parent on board. I could get the Roman Catholic police officer on board to transition his kids. Like give me a parent that is like hesitant. And I, we, well, we always walked through that. So a parent that, you know, I've been really trying to work on comes and gives me like this Trump card for, it was just like, he was just showing like, wow, you don't know, like even the professionals have no idea. I mean, he presented this to the endocrinologist, the court systems, and it didn't matter. Um, and that was going on simultaneously. And that was also the first time I've heard parents say that they noticed it first, like 
where I was starting to get what you might hear of like the narcissist parent. I mean, Oprah and jazz is coming out. Like those things were really impressionable on, on mothers. And so especially kids that were going through divorce, I was seeing a lot of this gender stuff happening and it was very concerning. Um, and and then, just, clar- just clarify, yeah. you went a little bit fast there. I think what you were basically saying was some parents were leading their children, mm-hmm. especially parents of divorce. Just give a little bit of time for that because you, you rolled through that. Yeah. Quickly, yeah, I mean, I'm trying not to say it as much, you know, as much as that was my assumption, right? Like that it was the first time I've ever seen a parent really fight for it versus parents who being like, are we sure that this is what's going on? So it was really clear that the culture was changing. And if you had a kid that was struggling with this, you you did have a, a prized possession in some sort of way. And then another piece of this was, and I, and it's hard to know if it's like how much like video games, the anime, the, I started to get a lot of people presenting as, hey, I want to be another gender who was clearly on the spectrum. And and it was so odd because some of the, like, as black and white as, like, they are, this was one of those weird things that w- was not black and white. Gender stuff was not black and white. And I was very concerned about kids who were wanting to transition who had really no understanding about what the expectations were socially and they were not presenting in any way, shape or form. A lot of people want to be another gender and take these hormones and actually not present as the other gender. And, you know, we were taught and challenged to not like think that one, you know, there's one way of doing this, but that was kind of concerning. Like, what are they expecting to get if, you know, they want to be affirmed as this, but in no way, shape or form, does that connect into the real world? And they it's were funny. getting upset that, yeah. yeah. It's interesting, if I was to be almost academic about it, it's like you were working within a, a, a framework which presumed upon gender identity theory, which is not a theory that I, I personally hold with, but there was a presumption of it. And then queer theory came in. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you were going, what, 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 what's, what is this? Like, this is not my training. And yes. in a way, it made you explore the entire thing. But just to go back to the FDA approved, because I would argue there's, there's plenty of other drugs that are plenty. not FDA. Yeah. So it, mm-hmm. it wasn't your only issue. I don't want people to think this was your only yeah. issue. There was there was plenty of other warning bells that made you scratch your head. Oh, absolutely. And like I said, it's just the quickness of it that they would come to me and tell me what was happening. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And it's just, it was scary because, you know, there is real life. There are some people that have certain medical conditions that couldn't take hormones and just the reliance on the medical community was surprising to me to say the least that that was what's going on. And one of the big things that I will say here, when, when we federally passed the Gay Marriage Act, we you know we have the human rights campaign here that shifted everything. So instead of fighting for gay marriage, human rights campaigns started fighting for transgender rights. So with that came the passing of our Affordable Care Act, which all gender transition was covered under. So the financial um, piece to this shifted. And then I realized too, is that, you know, I was a part of like, multi-million dollar industry you know for life i'm making people patients for life in the whole other category and 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 then i will say one of the big things that kind of confirmed to me that i that something was going on is i had a client who he was identified as a homosexual and he moved away to california and he came back and um he completely transitioned to female and which was surprising to me because gender was never spoke about in the years of treatment. And when I say transition, we're talking fully facial transition. So it looked like a completely different person. And he, and he decided he made a mistake and it was all from, he moved to California and was in an LGBT house. And it, you know, a lot of gay men are thinking if I was female, you know, it would just be easier to be with males. And 
I was blown away to see again someone's face completely reconstructed and me being like, I'm an expert in this and I didn't pick up on your gender stuff and you go away for five years and you come back and you're a different person. And that was where, and there was no help for him. And, and so he, he wanted to detransition essentially. That's yeah. when he came, he came back and regretted all of the surgeries mm-hmm. and the, the transition. Wow. Was that your first encounter with a person considering detransition? It was. And it wasn't, you know, we didn't even have a word for it at that point. Yeah. This and is probably it, like five years ago. Five mm-hmm. years ago, 2018. And because I'm just thinking of that, because I've heard of plenty of detransitioners going back to the clinic. And frankly, it's a credit to you that A, you can remember it and it it, right. it moved your brain. It opened you, it changed you, it made you think because so many uh, detransitioners go back to the clinic and they're effectively told, thank you, goodbye. Thank you for telling us. Not sure why you're telling us. Nothing you can do here because we transition people. So we've nothing, you know, politely, we've nothing for you here. And I think, what happens in the coffee break? What happens, what do the clinicians say? So did you talk about, did you say, hang on everybody, I want to talk about what I met this week in your case conference and say, we need to think about the implications. Did all of that happen? Yeah. And I was, to- you know, was told, well, that's just a rare case. That's just the one in, you know, the very, very rare who, you know, wasn't thinking clearly. But again, to me, a very well adjusted ad- adult was impacted and came back and like, and that was another thing of, I see, you know, people now and then, you know, they come in, I mean, they say, okay, I'm 16. I have gender dysphoria. And I say, well, how long have you been feeling this way? And they'll say a year or two years. And, you know, in our training, that wouldn't have been the case. Like we wouldn't have transitioned someone who's a year, just a year thinking about this. It's usually, well, since I've been two. So that was just, again, this like, oh, it was introduced to you. Right. Like, again, when people were talking to me, they didn't have language for it. They didn't know what they were experiencing, you know, so. Mm. Can can I ask about the about that um, kind of training and like what you did or didn't know? You said that initially you were working with a lot of females who were adolescents, like 14, 15 ish. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And you talked about when a person has had a sense of gender incongruence, let's say, since the age of two. Were you trained about the desistance literature, about 60 to 90 percent of young people who have d- gender issues from age of two growing out of it by the time they reach adulthood? Like, is that something that in the Marcy Bowers and endocrinology, like, is that something that was talked about and known? So it was in 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 my publication. Yes, we do say that a lot of people do get out of that. Yeah. So it wasn't, again, so clear of, hey, I want to get you to that to the endocrinologist mm-hmm. from the beginning, but be, mm-hmm. it became here is step one, two, three, four, five. Right. And, um, but I will say, you know, looking back and even going forward, I've been doing a lot of research of like trying to find books in the seventies of like, well, how do you, how did we teach people how to deal with body dysphoria, you know, 50 years ago, they never did teach us how to deal with someone that didn't want to transition. Yeah, because I do have people that don't want to. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, in another interview that we did recently, um, a very well researched uh, person was telling us about this series of letters to an endocrinologist in the 1950s. Um, basically, this was the endocrinologist that helped Christine Jorgensen transition. And when that story went public, this endocrinologist got flooded with thousands of letters from people all around the world. And it was really interesting because he put it together into like an academic paper. And for the few people that described going to a doctor or going to a therapist, it seemed like nobody had ever said, you know, you're dealing with some distress around gender roles or around your body. Here are some like therapeutic ways to cope with it. It was always either like force this person back into the gender stereotypes of their birth sex or like treat them as a psychotic person or treat it as a fetish that's completely intractable, which, you know, I'm open to the possibility that for some males fetishes are intractable over life. Like I'm not saying that I know for sure, but there was never a real 
kind of like psychological attempt to help people make peace between the mind and the body. It, it was very either like punitive or disconnected. Yeah. So I think that's such a good point that like nobody's really explored that in a deep way. I mean, no. they're, they're trying now. And I because think the numbers you, exploded, I think. But yeah. Yeah. And I think later in life, being, you know, these wasn't the words used, but now, you know, trauma informed care, right? That's the thing. How can we be trauma informed and then not be talking to them about when they slice off their breasts? Like that was the piece. And I think what's really got me nervous about the field is I knew in grad school. So in my program, I think there was maybe 15 of us, 20 at the most. 50% of us were uncomfortable with talking with clients around sex. And we were marriage and family therapists. So for wow. me to know, for me to know that any therapist was going to be t dealing with this with clients was really concerning because are you telling them that their clitoris is going to grow and they're going to want to hump the couch? Are you able to like, if you can't speak around your own stuff, that is another fear of like, all these counselors, I don't think they know what they're signing off on and what they're doing is like someone's identity of like, you don't talk to them about their body parts. I can't imagine we're being taught that. So what is going on with with this could, and what, what what are we teaching them? Could I come in on that? There's a coyness around sex when I talk to the gender affirmative world mm -hmm. and for for all the uh, we're so open mm -hmm. there there is there's an extraordinary kind of two things are going on it's like they're talking sex but they're not talking sex it's it's it's, it's very mentally strange so that you're you're it's it's like the picture of being open and talking about mm -hmm. sex but actually in reality it, you'd you'd get much more openness about sex from the farmer down the road. Absolutely. You, you know what I mean? There's a lack of animal earthiness to it. It's all like well, that. And it's very yeah, it coy. Is. It's, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to penetrate. But you, you tell us about that. No, I mean, I just think about how about helping gay couple with sex? Like, I know that clinicians are you know, a little bit unsure about what to talk about. Yeah, it'll, it'll, if someone's dilating twice a day, if someone, is, you know, has uh, these surgeries, I, I just don't see the training around that. So there's no way that we're speaking around again. Okay, we're no matter what surgery we get, what are we doing to care for our bodies? And that was another thing of I started seeing young kids going through these surgeries and just thrown away. Like there was no follow-up care. There's none. There's no, here's a sheet of paper and you better dilate for twice a, twice a week. And you haven't masturbated your whole life. So you've never even touched that, that area. And now we're going to go and attend to it every single day. I mean, that's just insane. And so part of the issues was that of like, oh, they're not even taking care of themselves post transition. And I can't imagine therapists are knowing how to deal with that either. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for the show. To take an even deeper dive and support the show, join our listener community for access to exclusive content, practical tools and resources supporting gender and identity exploration. We're so grateful to our sponsor, Genspect, an international organization which offers an alternative to WPATH, providing a range of education, resources, and supports to anyone impacted by gender distress, GenSpect unites many different organizations globally and gives voice to thousands of previously untold stories. For more info, visit genspect.org. And thank you to our sponsor, GetA. GetA is an association of therapists who believe that individuals experiencing gender-related concerns ought to be treated using a whole person approach. We connect like-minded clinicians, provide educational resources and training, and help people with gender dysphoria find the right help. Visit GetA at genderexploratory.com. And now back to the conversation. I think we don't know how to handle sexual, I've said it a hundred times, but the sexual awakening between 10 and 20 of the, of the, they go from a child to an adult. We don't know what to do and we kind of dance around it. And my God, you can't dance around it in a gender clinic when you're stopping 
one, you're stopping the sexual awakening, and two, there's a whole cohort who are sexually repressed and letting their gender identity be their kind of their cloak that represses it. It's the one place where people have to be very comfortable talking about sex. Absolutely. And that's not the case. No. And I think it creates this bit of uh, like a feedback loop because therapists are squeamish about it. First of all, it's also really complicated because we're talking about an adult therapist talking to youth. That is Mm -hmm. already very tricky. We're humans, too. And it brings up a lot of complicated feelings. So that's one. Mm -hmm. And then generally, in my experience, this population is particularly squeamish about sex more Mm -hmm. than any other kind of teenage population Mm -hmm. that I've worked with. They're highly anxious. They already have discomfort with their body. They're kind of terrified and petrified of sexual intimacy. So you have two people coming to the table, both with their own hesitance. So it's just so much easier not to go there. Yet there's a lot of like sex positive language. So kids are like filling out online quizzes about what BDSM position they like. So it gives the illusion of some kind of deep sophistication around sexuality. But Mm -hmm. actually, none of this is being addressed in a real way. It's all like cool labels and interesting flags and like go LGBT pride. But actually, nobody knows what they're talking about. And it's so easy to just be cerebral about it and like yeah. ask a kid to like rattle off their labels but nobody's really talking about the real issue which is like your relationship to your body when in arousal states like that's not really being discussed no yeah and absolutely just of what they're taught to connect to their body and speak over the body i mean parts being wrong like can you just again the power of our words being born wrong or you know that's not good to reinforce disconnect from who you are in any way, shape or form. And then they're going to have to reconnect to it if they're doing something to their body because they have to take care of it. Yeah, that's a very good point about the kind of aftercare of a surgery or a medical procedure. It requires a great deal of like willingness to get over your squeamishness, for example, to like to, to treat like an injured area or a wounded area, like it, with a lot of care and kindness and compassion. Mm-hmm. And if you are, let's say, in the throes of a pattern of self-harm, you're not even right. able to do that because a lot of these kids are. Uh, um, can I and- ask, uh, as, was there much talk about with you and your clients at the time, these are young clients, about the fact that they may not reach orgasm in the future, they may have a lot of sexual dysfunction in the future, and how sexually awakened were they to even be able to understand what they were giving up? And also, was there any talk about their fertility and how they, their care about their fertility, their maturity, their ability to understand not, not having kids? in the future, which was a distinct possibility, was pretty undeveloped. They they don't have an ability to understand that. So it's kind of two prong question there. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say I did. So my beginning clients, again, I kind of shift because I started to really see like this shift of like people maybe on the spectrum coming in and presenting in a different way that had no sexual history whatsoever. But some of the kids that I did see did have a somewhat healthy masturbation life or understanding that they were going to have very different conversations with partners and fertility issues. I will say that um, I did talk to my clients about fertility. I wasn't taught to talk about it. But I didn't have one born female ever state they wanted to do anything about it. Like that, you know, any connection to life was femininity. So that was Mm. completely always off the table. And I wonder if that shifts later. But male to female were a little bit more open to that. You know, um, a little bit more open to first like being able to collect their sperm and because they were becoming female they were more in dream world around being a mother so that was significant whereas i do not see the female to male as much being able to identify as fathers and actually i've seen a lot of people who transitioned female to male who later have kids start saying referring to themselves as they or even 
back to the she because they're kind of disconnected from the father part of whatever that may look like. Wow. Yeah. So can you kind of take us back to the, the timeline? You started to see things that were concerning you. And I think Stella asked, like, what was the water cooler talk? Like, did you start raising this concern with colleagues? Maybe let's pick it up from there. Did you start to raise... Uh, these conversations with other therapists. Yeah, so we did start to raise some things. And, you know, again, people were allowed to think differently, you know, then there was an aspect of very quickly, I want to know is Planned Parenthood comes in in the picture. So I would say probably within like six years of me doing it, I'm not so, so needed until we, maybe we get into a surgery or something like that. But we could get hormones online. We can get hormones like anywhere, right? So it's not, it's not that. But yes, when I started bringing it up, it would be, well, that's your views of male or female. Maybe you need to rethink about that. Or um, what's your, what, what is wrong with you that you're uncomfortable with how they want to identify? Mm-hmm. And so... I, I mean, sad to say, is just I just stopped taking the I just stopped taking those clients because I didn't want to have to be concerned about the work I was doing. I would say right or wrong in the beginning, I was I'm very confident around the things I was doing and signing off on, but I couldn't be anymore. And was there any definite? Was there any moment you said that's it? I'm out. I know the beginning of that moment was the D-trans guy, maybe, but maybe there was others. Yeah, I mean, there was the father that uh, showed me the FDA thing committed suicide um, because he lost his, the battle in court to transition the kid and the courts said, go ahead and transition. And do you know what happened in the family or do you know anything about that or? That's very sad. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was like, woo, that was like a, that was a big one of like uh, an FU to the system of clear that not only were they wouldn't listen to professionals, they wouldn't listen to reason. Um, and so that was really kind of scary. And then there was another time where I was concerned about a client and them affirming the gender because they were very much on the spectrum and not mentally able to assess where they're going and what they're doing. And the hospitals, you know, declined to follow or consider that and went full on affirmation. And it just kind of kept getting really dicey because now CPS is going to be involved. And that's what started scaring me is that it was clear that kids were starting to have power against their parents to do this. Yeah. And so what year was it when you stopped taking clients and just kind of moved away from the field? I would say 2015. Okay. And then did you just kind of look away and do something very different? Like, how did you end up back in this world? Because, of course, you did the documentary, Mm -hmm. um, What is a Woman? And you have a Jordan Mm -hmm. Peterson interview, which is huge. So tell Mm -hmm. us, like, what were you doing when you weren't working in the field? And then why did you come back to start speaking Mm -hmm. about this? So, yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, I wanted to just run away from it and never, ever. I know I could, I mean, I work by my private practice, so I could pick my clients, just never take that again. Um, But, you know, I have kids. So I have a 10-year-old and I have a six-year-old and what they were bringing home from school started to get really concerning to me. Um, They were having kids transitioning at 10. My son was asking me questions like, how do I know I'm a boy? How do I know I'm not next? Did this person grow a vagina over the summer? Like very alarming. And I was like, and I was like, oh, there's a lot going on. And then Wait, wait, could I ask you, uh, when that was happening, where was your head? You'd kind of left behind. You'd felt, I think, burnt and shocked by what had gone on. And you thought that wasn't a good place. That had lost its way was really what you thought. That place had lost its way and the whole industry has lost its way. I'm moving on. And then you saw it coming into society. 
And what was, if I'd asked you then, what would you have said? Would you have said, I'm the only person who's thinking the world has gone mad? Or would you have said, something's gone wrong and I don't know what it is? Where where were you at there? Both. Right, okay. Both places, like, equally. Like, I still struggle of, you know, like, you probably know this going into it. It's like, once you are in it, it's like, I can't take that lens off. So now it's like, am I seeking it out or is it coming to me organically right um and then my patients my clients who are teachers and whatnot like the they thing actually concerned me i mean that was something again that was like would a lot of people i have a lot of transgender friends who are not comfortable with the they thing that made them very like what what's the whole point of this if we're doing if there's nothing there can't be something and nothing at the same time um and people coming in and saying, hey, how do I deal with it? My kid wants this. And like, what are they even saying? And me being like, if I go to literature, I can't give them an answer. There isn't an answer to this of what we're saying. It's a, it depends. It depends on how they are feeling. And that was really concerning of like all of these terminologies that it depends. And the furries and the, those things started to really concern me. Did, did any of this, I mean, I know that... Like, I think I just want to lift this up for the listener. We're talking about two different ideas here. The old school transsexuals had a binary conception of gender Mm -hmm. roles. Mm -hmm. So if Mm -hmm. you were female and you had gender dysphoria, you wanted to live as a male. You wanted to seamlessly blend in with men. You wanted to be seen as a man. Yes. And I think for some people in their mind, that's comforting. And we're talking about the new wave, which is actually about deconstructing categories and definitions. And so mm-hmm. I could be neither a woman nor a man. And I can have almost like the way art, art absurdism looks like beard and boobs. And it's all good. But like that doesn't make mm-hmm. sense to the old school transsexual. It doesn't make sense to the clinician nope. trained in old school transsexual transitions. But I am curious, did any of this new stuff make you think, I wonder what's going on with my old patients, the old school transsexuals. Like, are they actually well? Because we also know that long-term outcomes aren't amazing, even in the old school type. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. But but did, did, did any of this make you question the whole paradigm or was it more just like the queer theory stuff is weird? Yeah, I again, the answer is both. I can't, I do not have a lot uh, or if almost any follow up with patients I had six years ago. OK, so many of them came and, you know, I would say like once they reached some of their transitioning goals, they went on in their life. A lot of it um, will just coincide with being in college. So they went off to college and moved away and went on. Um, so I, I haven't really heard a lot of pro or against either way. I mean, I I guess I could look it up. Some parents I did travel with later, like we did travel together to teach other parents. So it wouldn't be uncommon for me to hear about it. So a couple clients I know are still fairly doing well, I guess, as they're transition, you know, still transitioned. So I don't really have, I, I, I do sit now and because i'm way more aware of the trans um detransitioners i have i've been more curious lately of what that might look like could look like yeah yeah Yeah. okay and had your clinic stayed in the old school transsexual strict quite contained you know you you were an expert and you were taking it very seriously had it stayed like that and even though the numbers were big but your clinic had remained. Do you think you'd still be in it? Had your son come home saying, can I have a vagina or whatever? He, I don't know what he said. Well, Sorry, I shouldn't say that. But you know, what well, I mean? let me be clear. Like, yeah. I wouldn't say no to these patients. I just let them know that the assessment would take one to two years and then they would say no to me. Right. So I would offer when people would call, and, oh, I'm still willing to do a very thorough assessment that I know how to do. And they were saying no. So it was kind of like I could. Oh, yeah. I wanted to remain, you know, ethic, you know, informed consent and do what I can do. And they chose otherwise, because why would you do that? Why would you take years, a year to figure this out? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So then you got back into it. How? And then tell us about the, the kind of appearances you had in the movie and Jordan Peterson. Yeah, so 
it started coming out a lot at my son's school. And I think what was really significant around that is my son was is 10 in fifth grade and um, bullying policies, right? And there was no gen- misgendering bullying po- policies and me calling the school and asking about it and them saying, well, it depends on intent. And I said, well, what is an intent of a 10-year-old talking about how the, this kid has been his male friend since kindergarten and now he's with females in gym and we're and and the school's not teaching them that's transgender it is that was what was confusing is that no one taught my kid that that kid was transgender they were teaching my kid that kid was a female and like that is not even real that's not reality and that was like wow there's something going on um so ironically enough, uh, a client of mine who is a teacher and who's been seeing a lot of the gender stuff sent me a clip of Matt Walsh on doc- Dr. Phil talking about gender and kind of like, what are you identifying as in this like very strong um, statement. And that night I had just messaged him on Twitter and said, hey, I you know just wanted to talk to you. I have had some concerns. I used to be in it. And I got called that night. And I little did I know that there was a documentary already filmed. I was the last person interviewed for that documentary. And that was where I, you know, spoke a lot about what I've experienced. I mean, I think what was unique about that is it's very short. Like, I mean, I talked to Matt Walsh about two hours. It doesn't even say in the documentary that I wrote the transgender assessment. So people don't realize I think how deep I was in it. Um, but from that alone, I had so many calls from all over the world. And that was like the surprise and the disappointment. I mean, I joke like that I'm the mafia head. I'm sure Stella, you feel like this too, where people call you and it's like, what do we do next? <laughs> like, like, can I get on the secret list? Hey, I want to be on that list, but like on the DL, like, you know, mm-hmm. not really out there. So it's just like, So many people from all over the, you know, Singapore saying, hey, we are dealing with this. Italy saying, hey, we're dealing with this. What's going on? And realizing, oh, this is there's a lot of people out there that aren't speaking about it. And teachers saying, you know, I I have like 50 percent. My clients are teachers. I think that's like just my health, the health insurance I take. But they're scared. They can't speak out. They're not allowed to say anything in school. So they're they feel like they're a part of affirming a mental illness too. And like the, it's on all of us now. We're all having to feel that soul impact of what we're doing. And do you, do you think that there will be, uh, I suppose Canada is particularly difficult uh, as far as I can see. And do you think there will be a, a, a kind of a critical mass in, in all the staff rooms, especially in the schools and stuff, where they're not clinicians, they're not bought into gender. Might there be you no? Know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so since uh, so I did more as a woman, probably filmed it almost like two years ago now. Then I did Jordan Peterson. That definitely changed kind of who calls, who's contacting you. But just recently, and I was just getting up, I wanted to read you guys the definition. So the schools, New York State guidelines came out for schools. Yeah. And they, you know, the definition for gender identity means a person's inner sense or psychological knowledge of being male, female, neither or both. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, and, you know, I um, work a lot with nonverbal people and pictures is really important to me. And I joke and I say, if we can't draw it, it's not a real thing. So I ask people, will you draw me they? Can you draw it? Can you can you tell me what neither feels like? Like, How does one feel neither gender? What does that look like? Can you draw it? And I mean, that's really scary of these are the definitions, including in that policy is that teachers are to be the gatekeepers. They are not allowed to tell parents that kids are transitioning and this is elementary to high school i would have a little bit of a different feeling if it was just high school um and this includes that he can be in the locker room of their choice overnight uh traveling with the gender of their choice and you know this was just passed this week and in, in teachers and parents state? sorry new york state new york state mm-hmm. yeah and i have helped um 
Alaska's governor, uh, I helped them write legislation for parents. I mean, Montana had to put into a law the definition of a male and female. So what I didn't realize is that there isn't anything to stop teachers from holding this from us, which is insane. And have any ex, ex-colleagues from the old days contacted you or where are they all at, I wonder? Um, so I, I would say I assume that, you know, the ones that I primarily worked with in gender with fiercely probably haven't watched it or don't know yet. I haven't heard anything. What is unique is I have a couple um, people, for example, that I went to graduate school with that maybe we didn't get along in graduate school because we were a little different. I would say I was probably way more liberal and open minded. And then maybe and they have friend requested me recently, like. So there's no there's no words, but there's some like nudges, okay, like that people have texted me or said something. But so yes, um, and old clients who have seen it, who are professionals, who are doctors and stuff like that, have mm-hmm. contacted me and been concerned. Um, I do get calls in my field, but they are terrified. They just feel like there's nothing they can do. And do you? Okay, you go ahead, Sasha. <laughs> I'm grilling. <laughs> I'm grilling, Sarah. I just want to say two things. I mean. First of all, I really would like if there are therapists listening to this to understand like we are growing lots of resources for like minded therapists. Geta is one of them. And we just want people to know that they're not alone. And Mm -hmm. I think there's something I mean, depending on the the setting where you work and depending on your situation, Mm -hmm. there are lots of ways that this could impact a therapist to speak out. But as somebody like myself in private practice, there's there's more of a chilling effect than any actual tangible risk to your practice if you get into this work. So I want to encourage people about that. And then um, number two, um, I I'm aware that every time I listen to an affirmative workshop or I hear the kind of pioneers of the affirmative care model talking to other therapists or doctors, one of the big things they emphasize is how to get parents on board. And you said something really striking, which I don't want to put you on the spot about, but you were kind of like, you prided yourself on being able to convince any family to get on board. And I'm so interested to hear, like, was that something that you think differently about now? Was that something emphasized a lot in your specialized training that you had as like a gender specialist? Like, where did that come from? Because like, as a therapist, I don't know many programs that teach the therapist that your job is to convince parents to do an intervention on their child that they don't like. Actually, we talk about informed consent and like the right to withdraw your child from therapy at any time. So that's a stark difference between most other fields. So if you'd be willing, like it's really brave of you to talk about it, but would you be willing to say more about that? Because that really struck me. Yeah, I mean, I would have to say... I cannot tell you verbatim, like, a training. If it, You know, I remember the one training where we mm. were taught how to teach parents how to do this. I would say it's partly my personality. Like, that was, I was not going to do something without parents being on board. And here's the thing as a parent, I've thought a lot about this, too. You know, because honestly, the parents trusted me the most. The more than the than the kids who I have the the most interaction with was the parents, and I think what it took was that they knew I was going through it so thoroughly. Like, mm-hmm. what did your what did it look like when we were? I mean, and these parents we were looking at pictures when they were kids. I mean, again, it I wouldn't want to say it was a little bit more obvious, but like to make it feel comfortable, like the one that wanted to be a boy, if I looked at pictures, always looked like a boy, <laughs> or you know, like so. They were like, okay, what has happened in our life? If you're saying that this is why, okay, then let's do it. Let's just do, then that makes sense. Let's like really look at it. Whereas I think now they don't even have to have a background in anything. It's, you know, just wake up one day and it, that, that is. So I was walking parents through what they were, what they were witnessing throughout their life. And um, they trust the medical professions. 
professionals. And I hear you. What? How much knowledge did you have of, let's say, the phalloplasty complications, the difficulty around mastectomies, the so many surgical complications, and the kind of the the, the relentless charge of testosterone through the body that seems to so often lead to at the beginning phenomenal great great feeling libido whatever and then seems to lead to an awful lot of problems vaginal infection infections and things like that how informed were you of it and mm-hmm. how much did you inform the parents of it whatever about the children who might not really have the capacity to understand it how deep did you go into all that like the phalloplasty being a biggie <laughs> yeah so training was not really focused on that. So we would talk about side effects. That's a part of this. And because in your letter, you would have to state that the child knows and has realistic expectations and understands what follow up care would be and and all that. Um, I would say I was in the community. So being in the community, I've had a lot of friends. So I've seen it in real life, right? So I've been able to see like, They didn't teach me, like, let me just tell you, you're going to feel really good. Not only is the testosterone going to make you feel good, but in five years, then you're going to lose all your hair and it's going to age you like ever before. Mm. Right. Like, I didn't know that until I was in it for a long time. Um, But I did tell people that. I mean, as weird as it sounds, I mean, I would share if you, you know, what if this meant you could only live for 15 years? I mean, we do know giving any hormones to people, the risk of cancer. I sign off on that for IVF. You know, and they would say, I understand. And like, again, I don't know how to assess that if that's even appropriate to be like, okay, well, that's at least if they say they understand, then they understand. But they were willing to say, okay, it's I would rather live 15 years this way than the other way. They were, but the parents, sorry, mm. <laughs> the, no, the parents, did they know like those kids who, who believe they're going to become a man are are, are, are embarking on a, on a world where there's there's riddled with with surgical issues, riddled with l- problems and failures and complications. Yes and no. So a little bit of yes, but there's I don't know if you know I don't know what to call it. I've been thinking about it because I don't know how I would write it. But there's um there's always this. Don't worry, there's a group. But. <laughs> But that's the problem that the group, you know, like all the this group deals with that. So when it comes to it, they'll have their people to deal with it. Yeah, that's the thing. People struggle with it. But that's what this group does is struggle with that. Yeah. You know, we we interviewed the Dutch clinicians who pioneered puberty blockers. And one of the things because, I mean, if you can't tell, we're very much against the idea that there's such a thing as an innate gender identity and that medicalizing is the only way to go. And, and one of the things we noticed in interviewing the Dutch clinicians was there was a sense of inevitability about how messed up these people's lives was going to be. So yeah. I think the premise was, well, these people either they're going to transition now or they're going to transition when they're adults and it's always going to be complicated and there will always be problems. Mm -hmm. But as long as we kind of pad them Mm -hmm. with as much cushion and comfort and Mm -hmm. affirmation as possible, we'll ease the burden. Like that seems to be a philosophy behind a lot of the gender affirming care. Um, One, one last thing that I have on my mind, I think we could ask you a lot of questions. Yeah, me too. (laughs) I'm interested in, and Stella, like, I don't mean to jump in on your behalf, but I'm interested in this child, the early onset gender issues. Stella had her own story of a very complicated gender issue. And I'm also thinking about um, the experiences of very masculine lesbians or very feminine gay men. And a lot of the detransitioners coming out talking about how they never had any acceptance for masculinity in a female body or for this really different kind of gender experience. And I'm I'm wondering, like, ironically, you know, gender affirming care is supposed to be this panacea of liberalism and progressivism and like open mindedness. But a lot of these experiences may just be part of a normal consolidation of a sexual orientation. And I'm I'm wondering if that is something that you have thoughts about or ideas about. I mean, um, Stella's not a lesbian. Let me just be clear. Stella's married and has two children with her husband. But but this this early childhood gender issue is often associated, especially for females, with a later homosexual identity. Yeah, I mean, I think now 
I'm, I'm asking a lot, again, asking a lot more questions. It took me, you know, when I was seeing the, I had a couple five-year-old clients, right, that were socially transitioned. And that's a really unique experience when it's very young because arguably no one really knows because it looks so, right, like, um, but it wasn't until working in sex a lot did I think about, okay, the person who is the kid who was saying, like, I don't want my penis, like, maybe they were sexually assaulted, like, and that wasn't something that crossed before, right? That wasn't, I mean, you would assess for sexual, I mean, you would assess for past trauma, but there was never, like, a connection to to that. And so I do think a lot of this, like you said, with the, the internalized homophobia, um, is unique. Although a lot of my teens would switch uh, their orientations with this too. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. Just before we finish on this very same question, did you meet and what were your thoughts around kids like me who who were as as trenchant as any kid who was really into it and who moved beyond it, beyond it? Had you a, a framework about those kids? And well, did you know? You mean, well, did you know the research that actually the studies show that the vast majority of kids with early onset move beyond it so long as their puberty isn't blocked? Did you know that? And did you know many kids like me who were like supremely dysphoric for many, many years and moved beyond it? Did you know any or many? No, because I, what I don't. What I didn't know then that I know now is I was I was put into place to get hormone blockers as fast as possible. Mm. That was my that was what I was taught to be is that hormone blockers are the answer. Right. So I was I, I was more I was aware that people could grow out of it. But we were actually taught if it, the earlier the onset, the more aggressive the treatment. Mm. And I wonder, I often wonder, do people think about people like me? Oh, she's actually truly repressed and she should be trans or something. Right, right. And they and I have heard Hmm. people being asked that. Yeah, I have been asked that, too. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, that's that's so crazy in hindsight. I think like when we're talking about kids not being able to visualize, let's say, getting pregnant or having a baby, like that's one thing. But when you're, you know, an adult and you have children and Mm. you're you already have gone through that development. Mm. It's so crazy to think of what would have happened had you been puberty blocked. It's it's Mm -hmm. and and I, you know, I really can't fault people who are trained that way it's like you talked earlier about the trust like you just trust that what you're being taught is well flushed out and um yeah yeah i have a client he's his mom's pretty um open and i mean he's in his 40s now but he's cross-dresser and his mom when he was younger helped him cro- like gave him options to cross-dress with and he's like you know, as I appreciate that, and I wonder if if I was growing up now, would I be transitioned? Uh, right, like how different that would be today. So it, it's just, and like I said, what's really unique is, I, I, ten years ago, parents didn't come in telling me that ahead of their pregnancy, like while they're pregnant, that they've decided if their kid ended up wanting to be another gender, they'd be okay with it. Yeah. And just that people have to think that our people are thinking about that is like really wild. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a totally different paradigm of like child development, it, I think. Yeah. And yeah. what they say, I, I will say like, again, my kids almost like 10 years ago never said, I feel male. Mm-hmm. They, mm-hmm. they never said they felt something they could never have felt before. Mm-hmm. So now when I hear well, I just feel male. I just don't understand why, how we could feel something we've never felt before. Yeah. The Whereas script. the, right, the emphasis was uh, before, like I'm very uncomfortable in X, Y, or Z, and this makes me more comfortable mm. versus like yeah. the reality of like, how are you feeling something that you don't have? Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, Sarah, we're very grateful for your time. Thanks. I think 
we'll we'll stop our main interview here and then for those in the listener community they can join us for our kind of dinner party conversations chat so we'll see you uh over there great thanks for joining us this week on gender a wider lens Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.